And now I am pleased to introduce Melina Cozanitas. Um, Melina has extensive experience at Pepperwood um, as a visiting researcher who has been studying native plants and vegetation communities with the Ackerley Lab based at, out of UC Berkeley, which is also where she earned her PhD in plant pathology. Melina serves as a biology lecturer at Sonoma State, teaching intro to biology, plant biology, and of course, mycology. All right, Melina, I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, this is, you know, a version of a talk I've given several times. Um, I'm really familiar with the Pepperwood Preserve and have done this in person. So um, being on Zoom is a little different. Uh, when I go into presenter view, I can't see your faces anymore. So it's just like I'm talking to my own PowerPoint. So I hope you'll forgive me if I stumble a little because this is a strange and new format, but getting used to it. So uh, in the past, I've given this talk with a hike afterwards. And so I've kind of changed things a little bit for this format because we do have an hour and in the past I would give photos of mushrooms that we were likely to see when we went outside. Um, I'm learning that a bunch of slides of mushrooms without any fleshy specimens to look at um, isn't as useful as seeing them in person because, you know, it's kind of the same the same effect you're getting from a guidebook or from just an internet search where when we're hunting for mushrooms, we use all of our senses. We can see the mushroom, we can feel how, um, you know, slimy or dry it is. We can feel the weight of it. We can, you know, get a better sense for the scale and the size. Um, there's all kinds of textures. Some are fuzzy, some are slimy. Um, another thing that we do is we smell the mushrooms. A lot of times uh, mushroom ID books will describe a scent. So if you turn the mushroom over and smell the underside, you will smell uh, radishes or you will smell uh, sulfur. And so those are really helpful ID techniques. Um, we'll also nibble the mushrooms sometimes because they'll have like a really acrid or peppery taste. And um, that's a, a ID feature that makes people nervous, especially beginners. But what we do is we just nibble it right on the tip of our tongue behind our teeth and then spit it out. And even, even a poisonous mushroom, uh, you'd have to ingest for it to start to affect you negatively. Um, so that is missing from this. And so I'm just prefacing the reason I've made some changes in this talk today is because we don't get that outside portion after this. And so since we have so much time, I thought I would tell you a little bit about fungi in general and how cool and excellent they are and how big a part of our lives they are, even though we kind of put them in these little boxes of, oh, it's mold or, oh, it's mushrooms, but fungi are, are everywhere and they're really um, getting a lot more attention these days. So I'm going to start by talking about um, some cool facts about fungi, and then I'm going to tell you about some cool facts about mushrooms and their life cycles, the different parts of the mushroom, and kind of lead you to like the path towards beginning to ID mushrooms that you see out on your own when you don't have an expert with you. So I'm hoping that's what this talk uh, will do for you. And then of course I'll go over some major groups of fungi that you might see, and I highlighted some that are out right now that you might see on a, on a walk around your neighborhood. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, now, and forgive me if it takes me a second to get to the right. And while Melina is doing that, I just want to um, reiterate, because I might have kind of glazed over this at the beginning, um, at any time while Melina is presenting, you are welcome to share questions that you have using the chat. So you can type those in at any time, and then we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. Um, so I'll be tracking questions that come in there and be able to direct them to Melina. So take a moment to find your chat at the bottom of your Zoom window, because that will be where we can collect your questions. Thanks. Um, okay, so... I think I figured out some things here, Holland. 
Uh, are you Holland? Are you seeing presenter view or? Slide? I am seeing presenter view. Okay. And what about now? Now I'm seeing your slide. Great. Perfect. Okay. So. Uh, this is a lovely oak woodland here that uh, normally we would be out gallivanting around in, but that's okay, not today. Oh, I wish I could see you guys, but I, but I can't. Uh, that's okay. All right, here we go. So I want to start with just what are fungi? We all have a preconceived notion of what fungi are, but I want to kind of give you a wider perspective. Um, if we go really wide and talk about like the kingdoms of life, fungi are these organisms called eukaryotes, which include plants, animals, and this group of little amoeboid, more microscopic things called protists. So plants and animals, that's pretty obvious. Fungi, those are obvious. Protists are like the garbage pile of, of uh, life that aren't bacteria and they aren't plants, animals or protists, and they have a eukaryotic cell, which means they have a nucleus. So fungi are like us and plants in that they share a nucleus. Uh, they're typically multicellular, so they're bigger organisms. They're, they're made up of many cells, with one exception, which is yeast, which is a really important type of fungi. Those are the only unicellular fungi out there. Um, fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. We shared, animals shared a common ancestor with fungi about 1.5 billion years ago, but neither group shared an ancestor with plants more recently. So um, one of the main reasons that we can think about how we're more related to fungi than, than plants are related to fungi is plants make their own food from the sun, where animals and fungi both have to eat something other than themselves. So they have to digest it and get their energy from a different source where plants can, um, are autotrophs, they can make their own food. Um, fungi are super important for uh, chemical cycling. They recycle elements back into the environment in forms that other organisms can then use. So we think of fungi as the great decomposers, and that's a very important role because otherwise we would have buildup of detritus, dead material that would just sit and sit. So fungi are very, very um, important for nutrient cycling. And they're super uh, various. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, not just the typical toadstool mushroom that you think of. Um, there are more than 120,000 known species of fungi. And by known, I mean they have a name. They've been identified and gone through a, a, a naming system of classification but it's estimated that there's up to 3.8 million species of fungi. So of the 120,000 that are known, that leaves you know, over 2 million species that have yet to be discovered and named. So if you're into taxonomy and classification, fungi are the group to study. Um, and they have all different kinds of unique forms of structure and uh, types of nutrition, ways they get their food. So we'll talk about a few different ways that fungi do life in this, in this presentation. So some of you may have seen or be familiar with the um, humongous fungus. You, you've seen it on the side of a U-Haul truck. It gets a lot of press and attention. Um, and it is true, this, this single fungal organism in Oregon is over three and a half square miles and if it was weighed, it could be between 7,500 and 3,500 tons. Uh, it's over 2,400 years old, which is rivaling the bristlecone pines for the oldest living organisms. Uh, and basically what scientists have done is they have tested different areas of the state um, and run um, genomic genetic testing and, and shown that this is actually one individual that um, has spread out over this great distance. So we think about a single little mushroom, but under the ground, these are massive organisms that can be massive organisms, which is just pretty cool to think about. Uh, but in industry, there's a lot of uses of fungi that we don't necessarily think about that we see in our daily life. So we know about mushrooms as food. Uh, the mushroom foraging industry is huge. Uh, most commercial foragers are looking for very specific, delicious, edible mushrooms. 
Um, mushrooms are farmed, the, the kind that can be farmed are farmed, the kind that are foraged have to be, have to be picked by experts um, because every year um, people will die of mushroom poisoning. So about this time of year, we'll start to see stories where uh, someone maybe from another country who was used to foraging in their home forests will come here and pick uh, similar looking mushrooms, but we have a deadly look-alike or not all mushroom poisonings end up deadly. Many can just make you wish you were dead. Um, <laughs> we, call, we call it a gastrointestinal distress, a nice way of saying you'll be spending the night hovering the toilet. Um, so this happens every year. Um, that's one of our main ways we think about mushrooms for food, but mushrooms or fungi are present in, in many different types of food that we eat. Uh, this image in the bottom right here is um, a fungus called corn smut or ustilago, and this is a, a, a very delicious a delicacy in, in, um, in many cultures. It's actually uh, from the Aztec population, but you'll find it in Mexico and a lot of Mexican food. Um, it's known as uh, huitaloche, and sorry if I butcher that pronunciation, but it's supposedly quite good. And this is a parasitic fungi that takes over ears of corn, um, but is used as a food source. Um, we know about stinky cheeses, uh, camembert, roquefort, blue cheese, those are uh, fungi um, induced flavors that you're enjoying. Uh, soy sauce, um, ferment, fermentation process, um, and actually, surprisingly, citric acid is derived from fungi. So many years ago, the first types of citric acid, um, which is just a byproduct of, of, um, of anaerobic, uh, well, let me say, using oxygen to break down energy from food. Um, so citric acid is, is a normal byproduct of that. Um, but after World War I, uh, there was a disruption in the import of citrus. And so citric acid for our soda pops and everything else that it's used for um, was found to be um, in this, well, it's a mold very related to the penicillin mold. So aspergillus was found to be able to produce large amounts of citric acid when it was fed sugar. So uh, Pfizer actually, who is in the news a lot now with the COVID vaccine, uh, was the first to begin industrial level production of citric acid in about 1930. So all, anytime you see citric acid on a, in an ingredient, know that it came from, it came from a mold that produced that citric acid for you. Uh, some other really important uses that commercially um, anti-cancer properties of fungi are now being um, extracted from a lot of, of species. They, sorry, my dog. They uh, boost immune systems in cancer patients and can have some anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, they're not cancer fighting, but they can aid in cancer treatment by boosting immune systems. Um, antibiotics, of course, penicillin revolutionized uh, the health industry and, and helped people live a lot longer. Um, vitamins, anti-cholesterol drugs, um, a lot of these are, are derived from fungi. And there's a lot of um, genetic studies that are um, used uh, with species of fungi, mostly because they behave well genetically and so they serve as these model systems that we can then study genetics with. Um, another interesting thing that's popping up is mycoremediation. This is like bioremediation where you use a biological agent to help um, clean up pollution, but mycoremediation is taking off uh, a lot of species of mushrooms make these mats that will absorb oil. So in oil spills, we can lay down these mats of, of um, mycelia, which I'll talk about in a minute, that will actually absorb the oil. So these are a lot of uses of fungi that are beyond just um, food, which is what we think about most often. And of course, some of the most important uses of fungi are fermentation. So bread, wine, beer, uh, cheese, basically all of these things 
are a product of, um, of fermentation. So all, all species, including us, um, break down our, our food and we use oxygen to do so. And so you may have had, heard of like a lactic acid fermentation. So that happens in your body when you're working out hard and your muscles are using more oxygen that is available to them. So a byproduct of that when the oxygen doesn't have a molecule to bind to is the buildup of lactic acid. And that's why your muscles get sore after you work out really hard while there's a limited amount of oxygen in your blood supply. So when animals um, go through this fermentation process, when microbes specifically do that, the result is cheese, um, pickles, soy sauce, yogurt and dairy products. Um, but when fermentation happens in the absence of alcohol, excuse me, in the absence of oxygen, or more specifically, when the microbe, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. When the microbe is fungus, instead of any of those other types of animal microbes, the byproduct is alcohol, it's ethanol. So when yeast go through that exact same process of breaking down food, their byproduct um, is what we then use to produce beer, wine, and bread. It's an alcoholic fermentation instead of a lactic acid fermentation. Okay, so enough of that sciencey stuff. Now I'm gonna start to talk about fungi specifically. So I mentioned that fungi have different ways that they live life or lifestyles. And that's basically how they um, get their food and how they break it down. So the first group of fungi that we're most familiar with are the decomposers. Another word for this is the saprotrophs. So this type of fun fungus is feeding on dead or decaying material. Our next group are actually predatory fungi. And you don't think about fungi being predators, but if you can see down in this bottom right image here, that is a uh, type of fungus, the fungus that feeds on uh, nematodes. So they will actually capture and kill nematodes or rotifers. Um, and that's really fun to watch under the microscope. Uh, another more common type of fungi is the parasitic fungi. Now these are going to live off a host without killing it because if they kill their host, then they're losing their food supply. And we'll talk about some examples of parasitic fungi in a moment. And then maybe the most important, hold on one second. Maybe the most important are the mutualists. Mutualistic fungi are going to be living in a symbiotic relationship with another organism. And in this case, unlike in a parasitic relationship, both species will benefit from this interaction. And we have two main examples of those. Um, the first being uh, lichen is a mutualistic relationship between fungi and algae. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And then the mycorrhizal interaction, which is very, very important in plant life. And remember that word mycorrhizae, that means um, mycofungus and rhizae root. And I'll talk about that interaction in a moment too. So I want to focus on parasitic for a minute, and then we'll get back into the mutualistic. Parasitic fungi, in my opinion, since I studied plant pathogens, um, are the most fascinating group. So most pathogens of plants are actually fungal. There are some viral and bacterial um, diseases that we'll see on plants, but the vast majority are, are fungal. So when I say I study plant pathogens, that is essentially me studying the fungi that are pathogenic on plants. Um, so most of those are parasitic and some of them are too good at being parasites and they actually kill their hosts, which isn't advantageous for the fungi. So when we're talking about parasitic fungi, we're talking about fungi that absorb nutrients from the cells of a living host. It's very, it's very um, sneaky way to live life. So there's about 50 species of fungi that are known to be parasitic in humans and other animals, but again, the most of these are on plants. Um, so yeast infections are caused by fungi, athlete's foot, uh, ringworm, which a lot of wrestlers will get from the wrestling mats. And the one I find the most interesting when I learned was fungus was uh, dandruff. So dandruff is a 
a fungus that's living on your scalp and causing um, the flaky result. So if you look at your anti-dandruff med medication um, in your shampoos, you'll see that it's, it's mostly um, antifungal. Okay. So about 30% of all fun known fungi are parasitic. And some of the most famous ones are um, the fungus that causes Dutch elm disease, a devastating tree disease. Um, uh, another fungus that we call deadly ergot, which causes ergotamine uh, reaction in people. I'll talk about that in a second. It's really interesting. And cordyceps. Cordyceps are used medicinally, but they are also a parasite on insects. So, Maybe you've seen uh, the Planet Earth documentary where they go over this in, in great detail and it's really no, cool, it's like cool video footage. Oh, I hear some background, somebody. Um, so what happens with the cordyceps fungus is it will, it will land on its host and it will make its way into the brain of the host. So the mushroom starts to grow, keeping the host alive but it starts to control the activity of its host. So the mushroom, when it's ready to reproduce, will actually control the movements of say an ant. It will say, hey ant, I'd like you to crawl up to the top of that tree because I wanna disperse my spores from up there. So the ant will, unbeknownst to it, crawl to where the fungus wants it to go. And at that point, the fruiting body will burst out of the insect's head. And you can see in these pictures on the right here, and it will then release its spores and cause the insect at that point to die. But the insect served its purpose. It fed it and it helped the fungus disperse its spores where it wanted to. Um, ergotamine is a really, really interesting system. So in this case, this is a, a grain of rye here or a rye plant. And the fungus will trick the plant into thinking that an embryo or a seed is developing in each one of these, um, in each one of these grains here. So it will- You've gone mute. I have? Um, no, I can hear you, no problem. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. you're good, Melina. Thank you, thank you. I can't see you guys, so it's a little strange. Um, okay, so- Basically, this fungus will go as far as releasing a sweet nectar from these infected seed pods to attract insects. For Melina, you have gone mute, Melina. Um, gone I mute. Think, I think it's just maybe on your computer. Uh, can someone chat the, the person? Yes, yeah, I, I will. Phyllis, I'll send you a chat. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so basically this fungus is mimicking the plant's natural system. It's releasing nectar, it's attracting insects to come and disperse its spores. Um, but what happens is when this infected rye grain is consumed by humans, it, the byproduct is, it's containing is something called lysergic acid. And that shortened is LSA, which is very similar to LSD, which is... Um, you know, the acid drug of the, of the, of the 60s that, that causes hallucinations. So LSA also causes hallucinations, but they're not particularly sought after. The hallucinations include burning sensations in your limbs, hallucinations, um, and then a lot of people who consumed this would go mad, become sick, and, and were vomiting. Uh, it also cut, cuts off blood supply. So uh, gangrene would set in in limbs, leading to the loss of limbs. Um, and now the reason, the reason this was such a problem was in, in um, kind of more feudal times, uh, poor people were consuming brown grain and the rich kings and lords uh, were consuming the white grains. So the infected rye um, would get into the population and cause these hallucinations in people that would go mad and lose their limbs. And um, St. Anthony was the patron saint of, of this infliction. And so it's called St. Anthony's Fire. And there's a lot of um, um, old art pieces and stuff kind of where you'll see hanging limbs above him that, that are, are documenting this, this period of history. 
Um, okay, enough about that. And then the last one I want to talk about are um, Dutch elm disease, which wiped out elm trees across Europe and North America in the early 1900s. Um, basically, it was passed around um, on infected wood and it spread through Europe. Uh, it was discovered by a Dutch scientist, that's why it's named Dutch elm disease, um, but the once like grand stately elms of Europe were wiped out by this. Um, North America stopped trade with Europe because we didn't want this disease. And it seemed to run its course. They found a virus that would eat the, eat the pathogen. Um, and so they reopened trade and then a new more virulent or stronger strain uh, came in on the next batch of wood and wiped out the elms in North America. I could spend an hour talking about all of the silly things humans have done moving living plant and lumber across um, oceans that have led to devastating plant diseases. Um, there's one more I'll tell you about, even though I didn't plan to just because it's so cool. Uh, the, there's a disease called white pine blister rust, which will take out um, a, a wide variety of pines. And white pines were known for having really tall, straight trunks. And so they were they were um, sought after for ship masts. And we had these great white pines in, in Eastern North America. So we would sell them to Europe. And it was expensive to, to process the, the logs and then ship them. So Europe said, hey, can we buy a bunch of seedlings from you? And we said, sure. So we shipped all these seedlings over to Europe so that they could start growing their own white pines for ship masts. Um, but there was a fungus in Europe that was not present in North America that happens to love white pine and love killing it. So in Europe, they said, hey, our seedlings aren't doing very well. They're not growing to be large trees. They're dying off. We don't want them. Would you take them back? Because they seem to grow better in North America. And we paid a lot of money for these. So we took the seedlings back and with them brought the parasitic fungi that now is everywhere in North America and we will never get rid of. So the moral of that story, which I will not go on about any longer, is the trade of living plant material, um, ornamental plants, is, is really something that we should, we should limit because a lot of these uh, vectors are beetles or they are, um, you know, these microscopic fungi that you can't test for visually at a border control. So sudden oak death was caused by uh, the trade of nursery plants. And it's just just the way we've regulated the, the trade of fruit across state lines and, and in the airport, you can't take fruit from one country to another. We should really regulate the, um, the trade of woody and plant material as well, because it can, it can bring devastating diseases along with it. Okay, that's enough of that. So the most important one and most relevant to us today is the fungi as mutualists. So again, these are symbiotic relationships where both species benefit. And I mentioned lichen, which is algal cells that photosynthesize and get their food from the sun wrapped up in fungal cells. So the fungi provide um, a home. They provide structure and nutrients for the algae and the algae provide food in the form of sugar that they got from photosynthesis. Um, and then another is the mycorrhizae, the association of fungi and the roots of plants, um, which I will talk about as soon as we get into this mushroom stuff. So keep in mind, the mycorrhizae is coming up. I have to kind of explain the, the life cycle of a mushroom before I can really explain that fully. So when we see a mushroom out on the forest, we think that's the organism, that's the entire um, body, the main body, but the real main body of the, of the mushroom is underground. What you're seeing when you see a mushroom is just the fruiting body. So just like we have um, fruit trees, an apple tree, the main organism is the tree itself. When it's ready to reproduce, when it's ready to make a seed that it wants to disperse, it forms an apple. And the dispersal agent, that seed, is protected inside that apple. So the same thing is going on with, um, with the mushroom. The main body of the organism is completely underground in the form of these mycelial strands, which we'll talk about in a second. 
When a mushroom is ready to reproduce, it makes a fruiting body or a mushroom, which is containing its spores or its reproductive dispersal unit. So let's start with the spores. Millions of spores can be produced by a single mushroom. We have some cool time-lapse images here um, that show the release of spores. And if you come up with, to certain sorts of cup fungi, you can actually see them poof, this little cloud of spores. Um, this species on the right here, Ganoderma, or the artist's conch, which is a hard uh, poly conch, polypore that you'll find on, on decaying logs, um, can produce up to one trillion spores per year. And we can actually see the effect of the, that spore production. So on the bottom left here, this is that same Ganoderma, and all of this brown dusting here is its spores. So this species has brown colored spores, and you'll see this in the forest walking around. You'll see this brown dusting, it looks like sawdust. It's actually um, the Ganoderma produce, producing billions of spores. Um, this mushroom up here, the honey mushroom, an armillaria species, which is actually the same species as the uh, humongous fungus I talked about earlier. Um, this mushroom will produce six billion spores each. So here's a big cluster of them, and each one of these is producing up to 16 billion spores. And so this species has white spores and all that white dusting is the, is the spores. So those colors of spores are actually really useful for us in mushroom identification. Uh, one of the first things you'll look at when you open a guidebook is what color spores does the mushroom have? So agaricus here, your typical grocery store mushroom has really brown spores where some mushrooms can have almost pinkish spores. And this pink is generous, we call it mycological pink. Um, but we can have yellows, greens, blacks, browns. There's, the guidebooks are hilarious when they describe browns too. They're like, is your mushroom cigar brown, chocolate brown, cinnamon brown, reddish brown? So it's like there's a lot, a lot of brown. Um, and these spores, again, are the dispersal agent. And so all a spore needs to do is find a spore that's essentially a different mating type or gender if, if you're trying to think about it in, in human terms. So where we have two genders that are required for a successful mating, uh, certain species of fungi can have up to 36,000 mating types. So all, or, or genders, if you will. All a mushroom has to do is find a spore that's a different mating type than itself in order to fuse and reproduce sexually. So after that happens, a spore will land and it will germinate in the soil. And as it germinates, it will put out a single filament. So this is this thread-like cell structure. They're long rectangular cells, filamentous. And we call a single strand of this filament hypha. When you have many hypha together, we call them hyphae. So the main body of a mushroom is made up of hyphae. All of the fleshy thing you're things you're touching when you touch a mushroom is just a, a mass of hyphae. When you have many hyphae together in a network, we call it mycelium. So this mycelium is the majority of a fungal organism's biomass. This is found underground or in wood, and this mycelium makes up the majority of the organism itself. Um, so here you'll see this mycelium spreading through the wood substrate, or when you pick up a mushroom, sometimes at the base in the soil, you'll see this mycelial mat. And so that's what they'll lay out when they're trying to clean up an oil spill. They'll lay out these mats of mycelia that will then absorb the oil. Um, some other places you've seen mycelia are on your rotting pumpkins. As your pumpkin starts to rot and you see all of the white um, fuzz begin, that's the mycelium. The black bits are the fruiting body. So not all fruiting bodies are the big fleshy mushroom we think of. In this case, the little black um, sacks of spores are the mushroom or the fruiting body itself. Um, mycelia is actually having a, a big uh, surge of, of alternative uses now too, as we think about waste management and alternatives to plastic. So um, styrofoam is able to be replaced by mycelium. Some uh, wineries are now using uh, mycelium packaging instead of styrofoam. 
and it's being used as a leather alternative. There's beautiful furniture, belts, purses that are being um, produced by these mycelial mats. It's really interesting area to see where that goes. So let's talk about this mycorrhizae I've been talking about over and over again. So again, myco is fungus in Greek and rhizae is root. And so basically this is an inner, a really, really important interaction between fungi and 90% of vascular plants. So vascular plants that conduct water and nutrients through their roots, 90% of those have this interaction with fungi happening underground. So basically what happens is the, the hyphae, those hyphal strands will wrap around the tips of um, a plant's roots and they will help to increase the surface area of those roots. Trees are fixed in place, plants are fixed in place. Their roots can only extend a certain distance, but the mycelia can extend a great distance beyond that. So what happens is the mycelia can move to areas where there's more water and more nutrients and help conduct water and nutrients into the roots of trees. So the plants are providing to the fungus in this beneficial relationship, sugar in the form of, of um, uh, photosynthesis, photosynthates. So the plants are photosynthesizing, they're making sugar and they're providing that to the fungus. Um, the fungus, is providing water and minerals that it's pulling from the soil and aiding the plant in their absorption of those. So we call these ectomycorrhizal fungi because they don't penetrate the tissue of the plant. They stay outside, so ecto. Um, so they wrap around the roots and here you can see the a sapling of a young pine. The pine itself root system stops about here. That's those those brownish large strands. The mycelial network can extend much further and aid that seedling as it grows. Um, it's also recently been discovered that um, a parent tree can actually hook up with its seedlings through this mycelial network and communicate which plants the main tree is pulling up nutrients um, and, and water from, and it can then distribute distribute those nutrients via the mycelia to its saplings, which are a distance away because they're all connected. And it says, hey, I want you to give my nutrients as this main big tree to those little saplings over there. So it's like this super highway of information happening underground and it's it's really fascinating. Okay, so I've, I've let you know now that the mycelium is the main part of the mushroom, of the fungus. Um, it's not a root system for the mushroom, it's the main body. And the mushroom is the dispersal phase of that fungus. So if we think about the life cycle from start to finish, your fruit will release spores or seeds, right? Reproductive packets of information. Those will then germinate underground, creating strands of hyphae, which eventually join together and form a mycelial mat that when that mycelial body is ready to reproduce, it will form a new mushroom. So that's what's happening underground. So a lot of people are concerned about um, overpicking mushrooms or overpicking a patch of mushrooms. Mushrooms are, again, a fruit. They are meant to be dispersing those spores. So if you go way, way far deep off trail, I tend to find less mushrooms because mushrooms want to be dispersed by humans and animals. They want to be picked up. Um, so as long as we're not disturbing the mycelial body underground, we're not disturbing um, the main organism when we pick a mushroom. So let's go over some of the parts of the mushrooms. So when you guys go out and start identifying your edibles, you'll have a better sense for the lingo. So we can start with the cap of a mushroom, that's very um, uh, self-explanatory. It also often gets called the pileus, that's Latin. And then we have the fertile area underneath. In this case, we have gills, that's not always the case. So this is our fertile area. And then we have our stem or stipe. Sometimes mushrooms will have a ring around the stipe or the, the stalk here that we call the annulus. And some mushrooms will have a cup at the base that we call the vulva. 
So when I showed you this diagram here, I showed you how the mushroom starts as a little pinhead and then as it matures into its main mushroom, what's happening is mushrooms start in this little egg shape here. And as that egg grows into a full mushroom, the outer covering here will break apart and leave features that help aid in identification. So we call this entire outer covering of the egg shape, the universal veil. So it's universally covering um, the mushroom as it develops. Underneath the fertile layer here where the spores are produced, we have a second veil. And this one we call the partial veil. It's gonna cover that fertile layer as it's developing. So as the mushroom grows, these veils break apart. And so remnants of that universal veil will sometimes be left on the cap, forming patches or warts. And the bottom of that universal veil, if it persists, will form the vulva. The partial veil, the, the, the membrane of skin, skin, covering that fertile layer where the spores are produced, when that breaks apart, if it persists, it will leave this annulus on the stem, this ring around the stem. Now they don't always persist. In some species, they'll disappear completely, but that's where those structures come from. They come from the universal veil and the partial veil. So let's look at some real photos. Um, in this situation, we don't have remnants of a partial veil it's gone completely, there's no annulus, but we do have remnants of the universal veil, that egg the mushroom started in forming our vulva. So when we pick mushrooms, it's very important to get down to the very base. You might think, oh, if I cut or if I snip the mushroom, then I won't disturb the mycelia, and that is good thinking. But some of these features that are buried underground are very diagnostic, and so you want to know if you have a vulva or not. So you wanna make sure you're getting the whole mushroom but not disturbing the mycelia. So here's some more remnants of that universal veil in the form of scales. Sometimes these will be warts or a big round patch in the middle. And then here's an up close of that partial veil remnant. So again, this was once the membrane protecting that fertile layer. And when it persists, it leaves this annulus or ring around the stalk. Our stipes can also, our stems can also be very diagnostic. Sometimes you'll have a rooting stipe. It's not a root, it's just a, a long, extensive uh, a stem that extends underground. This is the redwood rooter here, um, a really common species in redwood forests. You don't get a ton of mushrooms in redwood forests, but this is a common one and they'll have this long underground part of its stem. So now that you know the features, if you get into guidebooks, some of the very first um, features that they're gonna ask you to pay attention to are the shape of the cap. Is it bell-shaped? Is it conical? Is it funnel-shaped? And then they're gonna ask you about the gill attachment. So when you turn that cap over, are the gills attached to the stalk broadly? Are they running down the stalk, which is called decurrent? Do they notch before they attach or are they completely free? Do they come up and attach to the cap without ever touching the stalk? So those are the first two things that you can look at. And then there's a, a vast majority of, of stem shape. Is it bulbous? Does it have a cup? Is it rooting? Um, is the stalk central? Is it off to the side? Is it absent? Um, we already talked about gill attachment and shape, cap shape. But then you can talk about um, cap features. Are there warts or patches or raised scales? Is it velvety? Is it slimy? Um, it's important when you're hunting mushrooms to make sure that you have more than, hopefully more than one specimen because these are the same species of mushroom, but as they age, as they go from juvenile to adult to, um, kind of reaching the end of their, of their life as a fruiting body, they will change drastically. So these inky caps will start out in a tight little cone, but they will roll up and into almost a pinwheel uh, shape by the end of their life. So it's really important to make sure 
that you have um, a variety of ages when you're um, hunting mushrooms. Most of the guidebooks will be written about the, um, the adult stage, so not the juvenile and not the, um, the older stages. So when you're getting started, there are some kind of gross morphologies or gross overall shapes um, that you, a lot of books will lead you to. So it will, you'll open your page and it'll say, um, is it gilled? Does it have spongy bottom? Is it gelatinous? Are there little teeth instead of pores? Is it a puffball? So you can go directly to a page in a book and start sorting your mushrooms from that uh, section. Um, and then again, this is just a variety of how different books will lay these things out. But it's helpful when you're starting to not at a guidebook to have a, 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 a overall image to start with. So let's look at some actual pictures of those. The main groups of fungi that you will see out there right now are, um, are going to be broken down into these categories. So we call all mushrooms with gills agarics. And so the most famous mushroom, the fly agaric, the red and white mushroom, um, is where this mushroom gets its name. Our, gross, our typical grocery store mushrooms um, are agaricus bisporus. So when we say agarics, we're talking about gilled mushrooms. And then we have the group that we call boletes or poured mushrooms. So instead of having gills underneath the cap or blades, they'll have this spongy porous layer. Um, and these are a series of little tubes where the spores are produced. So on gills, the spores are produced on the, on the blade edge here. On tubed fungi, they're produced inside these little spongy tubes. This is Boletus edulis, the porcini, which is um, just starting to sprout under pines right now along the coast. Um, this is an easy mushroom to identify. It doesn't have any red or blue features. It's just kind of a little hamburger bun of the forest. And you'll see this kind of um, meshed, we call it reticulation at the top of the stipe here, where it looks kind of like a mesh or a screen uh, up at the top. So that's a real easy mushroom to identify and it's absolutely delicious. So those are our boletes or, or poured mushrooms. And then we have polypores, which are again, having tubes instead of gills, but these are hard um, conch mushrooms. They're very tough. Uh, and you'll find those on decaying logs a lot. And uh, um, turkey tail, which is a really uh, common mushroom around here, um, is a polypore. So if you turn it over, you'll see that it has uh, pores on the underside. Then we have our toothed fungi. So instead of gills or tubes, these have spines and the spores are produced on these little teeth. So this is the bear's head or um, pericium, the, the it also gets called lion's mane. These are out on oaks right now. They look like these kind of like ice crystals. This is a very, very easy mushroom to identify. There's not a lot of lookalikes um, and it will grow on, on oaks right now, this time of year. And these are a wood decay fun, fungi. So you can buy these in the grocery store because they're being produced on sawdust. Um, the reason that mushrooms like boletes over here are the porcini, are so sought after is they have to have that relationship with the roots of trees in order to produce a mushroom. So you can't grow these commercially. Chanterelles, boletes, those have that obligate relationship with the roots of their host trees. So that's why they can't be grown commercially. The only mushrooms you can buy in the grocery store that are like inexpensive are the ones that are grown in farms on sawdust because those are decomposing mushrooms. So these mycorrhizal species, those are the really expensive sought after ones because they have to be found. Okay, back to the teeth. Um, so these you'll see right now on oaks. And if you find an oak tree with um, a lion's mane on it, take note of where it is because it will produce them year after year. This is a very cute toothed little mushroom that you'll see in Doug fir forest. It grows on the cones of Doug firs. So if you have Doug firs in your yard, keep an eye out for little mushrooms that can grow on their cones these days. The next group of fungi are the club and coral fungi. We don't get those so much in Sonoma County, but if you go up into Mendocino County, you'll see these brilliant pinks and yellows. They look like 
um, they belong in a tide pool. So these are really exciting to find um, these coral fungi. Some are edible. This one in the bottom left corner is edible, but these can be hard to identify. There's an awful lot of them and they don't have a lot of diagnostic features to help tell them apart. Some other mushrooms you'll see around here on wood chips right now um, is this mushroom on the left. This is the um, birdcage fungus. It's a stink horn. Uh, the one on the right gets featured in uh, a lot of nature documentaries, but we don't, we'll find those in gardens if, if wood chips have um, been brought in that have the mycelium already on them, but they don't grow uh, naturally around here as often. But you will see this one on the left in wood chips right now, especially on at Sonoma State campus. These are everywhere right now. Um, so they start out in this little egg shape here, which are actually edible, but after you smell this mushroom, I don't know how anybody can eat the eggs of these things, but people eat them, they say they're good. Uh, so these mushrooms, these stink horns, actually use flies to disperse their spores. They smell like poop. I mean, flies like, like poop, and the flies land on the stinky substance that these mushrooms are producing. The spores get stuck to the fly, they go off and disperse the spores but these are fun to find. You'll definitely smell them before you see them. They smell like rotting, rotting garbage. And then everybody's favorite, the chanterelles. So these are base shaped mushrooms. And I'd like to point out that these have what we call folds instead of gills. You'll, get, you'll see them described as shallow gills, but instead of that like really distinct blade that you'll see on a Garrix, Shan this group of chanterelle mushrooms have these the like wrinkles or folds. And if I were to use my thumbnail, I could actually scrape off these folds. So that's one way to know you have chanterelles. They're base shaped. They have um, shallow uh, wrinkly folds instead of true blade gills. Um, and they are absolutely delicious. They have, they're pretty easy to identify. This upper uh, image here, this is the winter chanterelle. Um, these are, are a little bit later in the season out at Salt Point. Right now we have the golden chanterelle growing under oak or growing under dug fir. Again, with that obligate relationship, they have to have that relationship with the roots of the oak or the dug fir. Um, so there are some lookalikes for chanterelles that will trip you up for the golden chanterelles. Oh, and I should mention the black chanterelle here. These get described as um, looking like petunias, like a black petunia. They basically, it's like the absence of mushroom is what you're looking for. You look for these funnels out in the woods and it's hard to spot black mushrooms, but once you train your eye, it's possible. Um, these are one of my favorite edibles. They are absolutely delicious. Uh, these come out a little bit later as well. So the, the golden chanterelles are out now. Later in the winter and early spring, when it's still wet and still cold, you'll start to get the winter chanterelle. It's called the golden foot or this um, black trumpet down here. So let's talk about some lookalikes for the golden chanterelle. So this upper left image here is, it's, this is named the false chanterelle. But once you learn a few key features, you'll never mix it up. The false chanterelle, just because it's orange, I guess that's why it gets, it gets mixed up with these. But like I said, these will always grow in association with roots. So you will always find these growing on the ground. They're growing in the dirt. The false chanterelle is a wood decay fungus. So this mushroom will always be found on wood. If you find what you think is a chanterelle and it's growing out of decaying wood, it's not a chanterelle. Also, these have those true blade-shaped gills where our true chanterelle has those wrinkly folds that can scrape off with your fingernail. Um, another mushroom that gets mistaken for chanterelles is this bottom left image. This is the jack-o'-lantern fungus. So these are popping out at the base of trees now as well. These are much bigger sh than chanterelles and they have this kind of greenish hue to them. These mushrooms are a really fun party trick because they bioluminesce. So they will actually glow in the dark. 
If you're out on a really dark night, you can see a faint green coming from the base of the tree, you're looking at a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Um, but if you find a nice specimen and you have a dark closet, you can take the mushroom into the closet, sit in there for a few minutes until your eyes adjust to the dark and you'll see it start to glow. So that's a really fun one to find. If you think you found chanterelles and someone's like, nope, jack-o'-lantern, you didn't find them. Well, now you know that you can have fun with that jack-o'-lantern mushroom anyway. Um, again, they'll also always grow on wood. They're a wood decay fungus um, and they are uh, uh, toxic. If you eat them, they will make you sick. They won't kill you, but you will not have a good night. Um, okay, and then to the right here, we have um, our true chanterelle again, just for comparison. Uh, and again, you can see those, those little ridges or folds uh, versus these true blades. So I hope that clears some up up some questions about foraging for chanterelles. Um, the next group of fungi that you'll see right now are the puffballs. Uh, so these have a different form of spore dispersal. Uh, some have lost active spore dispersal altogether um, and they produce spores in enclosed structures. These are called gastromycetes. So the gastro is referring to the stomach. Um, and so it's like an enclosed ball. Uh, and they will crack open and release their spores all at once. Some will have a little pore at the top. So when you squeeze them, like in this photo here with the hand, they will release this poof of spores. Um, others, when they open up from their internal stomach shape, will um, have these segments that look uh, star shapes. And these are really, really cute little earth stars, we call them. Um, and some will, uh, the, when, the, when the openings uh, reflect backwards, they'll lift the puffball up. Um, so they're like this little acrobats and others will just have this um, kind of ball shape here. Uh, and then let's see, what else do I have over here? Some of the common names of this one that's getting puffed in the middle, the common name for this mushroom here is the wolf fart which uh, is pretty fun. Uh, lycoperdon, lyco means uh, wolf in Latin. And I guess this somebody with, who was naming this cleverly thought it looked like a little, little fart poof. I guess if good thing farts don't have colors, that's probably what they look like. That's what I imagine anyway. Okay, uh, very professional, yes, here. That's how my college is. We gotta have fun. And then I wanna highlight this little fungus. You'll see these out on twigs right now. So if you're looking for big showy mushrooms and you're not finding any, narrow your focus down. There's fungus everywhere with this rain right now. And you can find little treats like these bird's nest fungi. So these are on twigs and they're no bigger than my uh, pinky nail, but they're a little cup. And inside you have sacks of spores and these weight for raindrops to splash into the cup. Um, and then that will send the sack of spores shooting out. And that's how these disperse their spores, their raindrop dispersed. So those are really fun to find right now. And then we have jelly fungi. So jelly fungi will dehydrate in the summer, dry seasons. And then when it starts to rain, they'll rehydrate. And they're these gelatinous blobs. They can be yellow orange, brown, clear, black. And one of my favorite jelly fungi that you'll find up in Mendocino County right now is this one on the upper right. Oh, I lost it uh, here. And that's called the cat's tongue. So this is a toothed fungi. Remember you can have gills or pores or teeth. This one has tiny little teeth that resemble the raspy uh, tongue of your cat. And these are a really, really cute little Fun, fun fungus to find. And they're actually edible. I've heard people will candy them um, and, you know, eat them as little treats. So hope hope some of you find some of these out there in your searches. They're really cute. And then I have to talk about one other group of, of fungi here that are technically not fungi, but are studied by mycologists because they look like fungi and they act like fungi. This is one of those protists I was talking about. These, this kind of junk pile. They don't fit taxonomically in. It's like they're defined by what they're not. They're not fungus. They're not plant. They're not animal, but they have the same kind of cell that we all have with the nucleus. So these are things like 
uh, brown algae and diatoms and this group of slime mold. So these are really, really tiny little things that grow on wood. Um, if you want to go down a, a wormhole of beautiful Google images, Google image search slime molds, and you'll see some really fascinating ones. Um, so slime molds are really cool because they have two stages of life. They can live in a unicellular stage where they're um, eating or reproducing, depending on what kind they are. And then they can live in a, in a, a colony. So some will live, will eat, in a single cell stage and get together to reproduce in a colony. The majority of the ones you're looking at here will um, get together to feed in a, colony, in a colony and then reproduce in a unicellular state. And so when they get together to feed in a colony, there's actually video of um, one of these, the one down on the, on the bottom right here, it's called Ficerum, that can go through a maze to find a food source. So there's this amazing video of, it's like a chicken nugget in the middle of a maze. And the slime mold starts in one corner and it works through the maze in this colony. They all work together. They go into different parts of the maze. The food's not there. They come back together to find the food source. So these are, these are really cool. If you're walking around in the forest and you find a colony of these and you smash it all up, and then you walk back an hour later, they will have reconvened. So really interesting group of, of organisms out there. Okay, so that's the, the grand tour, but now I wanna highlight maybe four or five species in our last 10 minutes here um, that A, will kill you and you need to avoid, B, are common and you'll see out and about right now. So I'm gonna start with the, the one mushroom that is responsible for the majority of poisonings, especially in our area. This is Amanita phylloides. And when, when people are getting into edible mushrooms and they're asking me questions, can I eat it, can I eat it? I stop them right there and I say, until you learn what the death cap mushroom looks like and you have it down, you, you, you need to learn this mushroom before you learn the edible mushrooms. So um, the death cap is a typical mushroom shape. It has all those features that we talked about. It has the vulva, it has the annulus around the stalk, and it'll often have patches of universal veil on the cap. It has a very kind of greenish, yellow to gray metallic shine to its cap. It's got this, this kind of shimmer. Um, the stalk is usually all white and it has white gills, its underside is white. Um, it also has a, a smell that's kind of reminiscent of like rotting potatoes. It doesn't smell good. Uh, the reason people get in trouble with this mushroom is when it's in this little button phase, it can look like other edible mushrooms. So you want to make sure if you're eating button stage mushrooms that you're examining them really well, um, and that you're, you're sure what it is. It went in doubt, throw it out. If you're not sure this mushroom's too small, I can't identify it, toss it, because one death cap in with 15 edible mushrooms will poison you and your family. And unfortunately, this mushroom leads to liver and kidney failure. Um, it actually stops your body's ability to um, make protein. And so it's, it's a part of the RNA process, and it's it's really fascinating. I won't, I won't uh, tell you what uh, exactly the scientific process behind this mushroom poisoning is, but um, I will tell you that it can take uh, a couple of days to kick in. So you eat it, you think it's delicious, you feel fine, and then a wave of sickness will, will come about. You're at the toilet, you're not feeling good, but then you start to feel better and you think, okay, well, I got sick, but it wasn't a deadly poisonous mushroom, but that's when the liver and kidney function starts to break down. So you're feeling better and then um, your organs are, are going to start feeling. So there are um, remedies that you, you can take. There is kind of like an anti-venom, if you will. Um, in Scandinavian countries, in Germany, this is, is more available. Um, it's actually less available here in the United States because it's not approved by the FDA. And the reason it's not approved by the FDA is the approval process is very expensive um, and not enough people require this, um, 
this extract uh, to to warrant that process. So make sure you learn this mushroom. It is mycorrhizal with um, oaks, so you'll see it under post live oaks pretty often. And it's actually an invasive mushroom. It's coming in and replacing the native mushrooms. Like an oak tree might have a mycorrhizal relationship with chanterelles. And then this mushroom is an invader. It will come in and uh, take over that mycorrhizal association. And then your chanterelle patch is gone and now you have a death cap instead. So this is, this is one to learn for sure. Um, less common around here, but it does occur uh, uh, is the all white version of this deadly ammonita. And it has a fun, fun common name as well, the death angel. So when you're getting started, avoiding all white mushrooms is, is a good move until you get more familiar and confident. Now there are a couple edible ammonitas that have all the same features, um, the vulva, the annulus, the remnants of the universal veil on the cap. Um, and, and brave people will eat these. This Amanita calyptroderma is, is out right now. It is um, common in redwood forests, especially in, in Mendocino. Uh, the one on the left, Amanita velosa, that's our springtime Amanita. So you won't see that now, but it looks pretty similar. It's a little bit pinker in the cap, um, and you'll see those under oak in the spring. Um, now, these have some really distinct features. Calyptroderma over here will have this it kind of reminds me of like a pancake with a fried egg on top, um, but it will always have these cap striations on the margin of the cap. You'll see these little lines and it has a hollow stem. So if you're brave, I don't recommend it until you're uh, really certain that you know what the rest of the ammonitas are because that's a deadly mistake. But if you find a mushroom and it has all of those characters, it has the striations, it has the hollow cap, the hollow stipe, it has the, um, the patch of universal veil on the top, then you can give it a try. I've tried this mushroom and considering how risky it is to pick, I don't think it's the most delicious mushroom. The Ammonita velosa on the other hand, the springtime Ammonita is, is quite good. So, so that one I'll, I'll go looking for in the spring. And of course there's our, our most well-known Ammonita, the, the fly agaric Ammonita muscaria. And I don't have quite enough time to tell you about the fun uh, tales of, of Christmas that are associated with this, with this mushroom. But uh, since we're approaching the solstice, I thought I would add this in. Uh, there's a lot of lore around um, Christmas stories and, and the red and white um, symbolism of this mushroom. So uh, shamans were said to bring this mushroom to uh, individual people's homes. Um, around the solstice, the darkest time of the year to up morale because this mushroom does have some psychedelic properties when it's passed through the bladder of a reindeer or the shaman. So if you eat this mushroom, you'll get pretty sick, but if you were to drink the urine of a reindeer that ate this mushroom, you might get some of the uh, hallucinogenic properties. So the story of Christmas that's wrapped up in this is really, really fun. The, the, the reindeer ate this mushroom. They seem to be prancing about. They grow under evergreen trees in the north. When the north star is in the sky above the top of the tree, the shaman couldn't get in through the, the door because it was snowed in. So he would come in through the chimney and dressed in red and white as the mushroom. And you can see where that goes from there. So it's really fun. It's a fun Christmas tale if you're into mushrooms to read up on, on the lore there. Okay, a couple other mushrooms that you'll see out and about right now. Um, people are really interested in, in turkey tail right now because they're being used uh, more often and there's more, there's more info out there about them being used for medicinal properties, um, especially in immune boosting um, avenues of fighting cancer. They don't fight cancer cells themselves, but they can help your body to be healthier in order to do that. Um, so when you're out in the world, you will see these turkey tails growing on decaying logs, and they have these concentric rings of, of, of color. So they have these really bright bands of color that will alternate from light to dark, resembling um, a splayed out turkey tail. And when you turn them over on the underside, you'll see that they have those tubes we were talking about. So true turkey tail, the genus Trimedes, has tubes. 
there are false turkey tail out there that in this bottom right image you can see they also have those alternating concentric rings of color but they tend to be in the more uh, tan and, and brown color spectrum and when you flip those over on the underside instead of white and with tubes they will be orange and completely smooth so the spores are produced just right on um, the underside here instead of inside a tube so you have your true turkey tail trumedes that has tubes and sterium, your false turkey tail, that will be more orange hued and smooth on the underside. And then I wanted to add a couple uh, lawn mushrooms that are out and about right now. Um, these are very reminiscent of your typical grocery store mushroom, but this is kind of a fun trick when you're walking the dog in your neighborhood, you can start to show people some differences. Um, we have a couple groups that are really easy to tell apart. Um, our Agaricus californicus, which has a darker center and at, if you scratch it, it'll turn yellow, but like not very quickly versus this Agaricus xanthodermis, which when you scratch the cap, it will start to yellow up very quickly. And its Latin name is fun and nice and descriptive. Xantho means yellow in Latin and derma is skin. So it's the yellow skinned Agaricus. And if you see an all white version with a white underside as well, that is um, the genus Leuco Agaricus which leuco means the white version. So where true agarics will have pink to brown underside because they're brown spored, a leuco agaricus will have a white underside because it's white spored. So these are just some helpful uh, ways to break down Latin names in a way that helps you remember uh, what you're looking at because the Latin names, if they're good names, are, are descriptive. And then another mushroom that's out and about right now in droves in, I'm in Santa Rosa and I'm seeing these everywhere, are the uh, honey mushrooms, the Armillaria melia, which we discussed, or this group of species. And we talked about these as that humongous fungus in Oregon earlier. Um, so these will be in big clusters at the base of trees right now. And they have that annulus that we talked about. You'll often see white powdering of spores from one that fall onto the mushroom below it. Um, this can be an easy mushroom to identify, but it can also be a tricky one. I have been tripped up by this mushroom because it, it can look quite different. It has scales on the caps, and we do think this is a group of mushrooms more than a solid, um, uh, well-described uh, species that we have, we have variety within those. Um, and this mushroom, even after years of doing this, will, will trip me up sometimes. I'm like, what is this? It looks so funny. And then turns out to be a honey mushroom, but, but you'll, you'll see these at the clusters, uh, in big clusters at the bases of trees right now. And then another one that it's kind of, oh, those images are real fuzzy blown up. I apologize for that, um, is the uh, sulfur shelf or the chicken of the woods. These will grow on eucalyptus or um, oak trees around here these days on decaying wood. Uh, this is a really, the reason I'm highlighting this one is this is a really, um, easy to identify mushroom, but it also is responsible for making a lot of people sick. And some people will say, oh, if it's growing on eucalyptus, that is more likely to make you sick than if you find one growing on oak. I don't find that to be true. I find that the stories I've heard of people getting sick are, it's an issue of undercooking. So if you do find this mushroom, which is really easy to identify and a good beginner mushroom, um, make sure you cook it really, really thoroughly. So cook it until you think it's done, cook it another 20 minutes until you think it's done, and then keep cooking it another five. Just really want to cook this mushroom well. Um, I know that because I say that because I've, I've heard too many stories of people that were really excited about mushroom hunting and they were really happy they found, you know, they made a positive ID and then they made their friend sick. So not a good, not a good way to start. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple tips on photographing fungi and collecting fungi so you can get started on your own. Um, when, especially in times like this where we can't gather, you may be wanting to send photos of mushrooms you find to someone you know who's knowledgeable. Um, but in order for someone to make a good or a useful identification from a photo, we really do need to see the underside of the mushroom. I'll get a lot of photos uh, sent to me that look like this upper right image. And it's like, that could be anything. Does it have 
pores? Does it have gills? What color is it under there? So when you're photographing mushrooms, you want to make sure to include that fertile layer, that underside. Any details on the cap or stem that could be helpful, like the, the vulva or the universal veil remnants on the cap patches. Um, and then if you can, include a little bit of the habitat or the substrate it was growing on. You can see in this picture up here, there are some coast live oak leaves included. So the, we know that the mushroom is growing in this habitat or if it was growing on wood, um, that's helpful to know as well. And then if you're dealing with boletes, a lot of them will uh, turn blue um, as a result of oxidizing. So when you cut them open and they are exposed to the air, uh, they will turn blue really quickly. It's, it's similar to what was happening with that yellowing skinned agaric. Um, when you scratch it or you disturb it, um, the reaction is it turns yellow. So that can be a really helpful diagnostic tool if you're um, asking uh, someone to help you make an identification from a photo. If you're out there collecting, there's a couple supplies you might want. Um, a fun basket is always a good place to start. I like to put a compass and a whistle attached inside my basket just in case I get turned around. Um, it's nice to have a whistle, just makes me feel better if I got tired of yelling for help knowing that I had a backup. Not that that happens, but good to be careful. Uh, wax bags, oh, little wax sandwich bags are really helpful um, for keeping your mushrooms fresh while you're collecting them. Plastic tends to hold the moisture in and promote uh, rotting faster than you'd like. Paper, uh, the bag can just break apart because there's so much moisture in the, in the mushroom already. So wax bags work out really, really well. Um, tackle boxes are a great way to keep tiny little mushrooms uh, fresh and safe until you get back and uh, want to identify them. And just the inside of a tackle box full of mushrooms uh, can look really pretty too. Um, you know, gloves, boots, a nice mushroom knife. Some will have um, a brush right on there built in so you can clean the mushrooms off, makes cleaning edibles uh, easier when you get home. And then of course, uh, guides. So a lot of people are using guides that they find on their um, cell phone or tablet now because that's easier to carry than a big uh, book out in the woods. Um, and I wanted to point out a few places that I go online to help um, ID mushrooms and look at what I've got. Uh, MycoWeb with a K is a great resource. They have a um, an area specifically for California fungi. So if you go to mycoweb.com and go to the California fungi section, then you can get, um, over here it'll look like this, you can get lists of genera and species in the area with really great photos. Um, and this, I really like this site as a reference site. It's better than just Googling um, and, you know, hoping you find the right one. And then of course, iNaturalist. So I have an iNaturalist project for Pepperwood. Um, and so iNaturalist, if you haven't used it, it's a great uh, citizen science app that helps, um, that helps collect data where, you know, the experts can't get to all the places that, um, that interested citizens can get. So if, if you're out in the world and you're documenting the photo, the fungi that you see, what you can do is you can upload it to iNaturalist and then people will come in, experts can come in and suggest um, identifications. And after two or three people um, agree on what that mushroom is, it will become research grade. So we didn't have to go out to all these four, far corners that you can make it out to, to find these fungi, but then we have data on where and when they're occurring. And iNaturalist is great for um, plants and birds and all, all kinds of organisms, not specifically fungi. So I, I encourage you, especially in this time, to, um, to explore iNaturalist uh, to help you feel like you're getting outside and seeing what's out there. It'll, it'll expand your, your range. Um, and then some guidebooks that I like. I'm going to start with the David Aurora books because these are the, probably the most well-known. Um, all the Rain Promises and More on the right is, is a pocket guide. It's really common. Most people tell me that's their, their book that they have. Um, and then the book on the 
left is the expanded version. It's, it's a honker, it's huge um, in comparison to the pocket guide on the right. Uh, so the problem with all the rain promises and more is people find a mushroom and then they assume that the closest thing they find in that book is what they have. But that book has, you know, maybe a, a couple hundred species where Mushrooms Demystified has thousands of species. So people are really good at finding the closest mushroom to what they have in that book. And a lot of the times for the edibles, it is the mushroom you're dealing with, but there's a lot more mushrooms that are, than are featured in that book. Um, so you can get close, but you won't necessarily get exactly what you have. Uh, the, mush the Mushrooms Demystified is more of a, of a diagnostic key. So it's like a choose your own adventure book. You start uh, with a series of options that will say, is the mushroom brown spored or white spored? And you'll say, oh, it's white spored. And then it'll say, okay, go to section five. And then you go to section five and it says, is the mushroom cap, is it gilled? Uh, oh, no, are the gills running down the stalk or are they not attached to the cap? And you'll say, oh, they're running down the stalk. Then you go to section six. So it's a, it's a, um, a dichotomous key. So you have uh, selections of um, one choice or another that will lead you in different directions to hopefully to your assessment. Melina, um, I just want to yeah. give a quick time check. We just have a couple minutes left oh, on, on our time. And I want to make sure we're able to get to a few questions. Okay, as well. this is my last slide. So perfect. Okay. Great. okay. Um, and some other books that I'm enjoying right now are uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. This is probably the book I'm using the most right now. And the reason I like this book for people getting started is there aren't any of those dichotomous keys. Um, if you're really serious, Mushrooms Demystified is a great, it's probably got the best keys out there, but some of the names are a little outdated. That's that's this one. Um, but if you're getting serious about ID, that's, that's a book to have. Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast will lead you to groups based on overall shape, and then it has fantastic photos. So there's no keys in this book, but it has the most up-to-date names, it has fantastic photos, and the, um, the way the mushrooms are laid out by a group is really um, intuitive. It's, this is a, a, an excellent book, I can't recommend it enough. Um, the one in the middle here, California Mushrooms, it also has great photos and newer names, um, in, but it has uh, the dichotomous keys. They're not as extensive as Mushrooms Demystified, um, but if you want to get practice using keys, the keys in this book are pretty user-friendly. And then I just like this series of books. There's Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest, there's Mushrooms of the Rockies. So depending on what um, region you're in, this has these timber press field guides have some nice photos. So those are the field guides I recommend for you. And um, that's my spiel, and I would be happy to open up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, though, so I can see your faces, if that's okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Melina. Sure that was <laughs> super, super informative. And we definitely had some questions coming in um, as you were sharing. Great. And I'm going to scroll back a little ways. Um, a couple people were asking about false turkey tail ah. and uh, whether or not that one is also edible and or if you can make tea with it. Well, I mean, you can, <laughs> but... Uh, it won't have the same properties as the as the trimetes, the true turkey tail. So when you're hearing that turkey tail is being used for these um, medicinal uses, they're talking about the genus trimetes that has the tubes on the underside. Great. Um, also, another question about um, the edibleness of some of the ones you were showing is uh, how tasty and edible are honey mushrooms? Ah, that's a great question. So honey mushrooms are quite tasty. Um, they're pretty sweet, uh, which is why they get that name. Um, the stem is a little bit uh, stringy and tough. So when you get that giant cluster, it's tempting to just cut the stems off and toss them and cook just the caps, but the stems are really, really tasty. So if you have patience, you want to peel the outer layer of the stem off. It peels off like string cheese, these kind of long, tough strands, and it leaves this pithy center. So it's a little bit time consuming and labor intensive, but the stems are really delicious. So 
Uh, the bolets are delicious. The chanterelles are delicious. They're all good. But the honey mushrooms um, are, are quite good. Yeah, I like them. I've eaten some this year already. It's fun to think of a mushroom like string cheese. Um, and I just want to say we are at 1130. So for anyone who does have to take off at this time, you're welcome to leave. We'll hang out for a little while longer, though, for anyone who wants to hear the que more of the questions and answers. Or if you have more questions, we'll just keep rolling with this. And so I want to thank anyone who has to head out. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we will follow up with an email that includes a short survey for your input on how this went, as well as um, some of those links that Melina was sharing earlier. And we could share a list of the, the books that she shared with us as well. So stay tuned for that email. Um, and let's see here, there was a question um, referring to one of your slides in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the slide that was describing ectomycorrhiza. Oh, and sure. there was some mention of leaky roots on that slide. And the question is just what what is that referring to? I'm like, oh, there is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it this one? Oh, we can't see it. You'd have to screen share again. Oh, oh. Uh, okay. Sorry. Why can't I screen share? Hmm. It's not letting me. Hmm. Let's oh, here we go. Here we go. I got it. Okay. Um, are you seeing all my slides? Oh yeah, if you scroll back, it was towards the beginning. I think it was maybe the slide with the little pine tree sapling and showing the, the network of roots and how the mycorrhizae, there we go. Uh, it's on the right down under the pumpkin one. Ah, okay, it was blocked by my other screen. So let's view that. Come on. Uh, ah, it didn't do it. Okay, I know what slide it is now. So. This one? Yeah. Yeah, the, it's, it says leaky roots oh. down there. Gee, I'm not sure. I borrowed this figure from a textbook. Leaky roots. I'm going to make a guess. Um, a lot of the roots that are involved in this interaction are the root tips or root hairs. Um, so a main root will be kind of like hard and, and woody, but it will have all of these root hairs coming off the side. And that's like the most absorb, um, absorptive um, I'm guessing. I'm, I, I'd have to look at this figure and, and read the legend. But that's a great question. I love how much you're paying attention. I'll, I'll find it as soon as we're done. And hopefully, I, if I find something interesting, I can add it in the, in the follow up email. Yeah, follow up. Great, yeah. great Thanks, question. Um, and then another question was um, Do you have any info about the results of various micro, micro remediation efforts after recent wildfires to remediate toxins from burned structures? If you've heard anything. Wow. About that. Um, well, I am doing post fire research at Pepperwood. Um, we're dealing mostly with the vegetation response, so how different trees react to the fire, but I am thinking about fire a lot these days. So I haven't heard about that, um, but that is a really interesting idea. There are species of mushrooms that we call fire followers. So they will sprout up in recently burned areas, um, including morels, which are a good edible that I didn't talk about today because you kind of have to go into slightly higher elevations to find those. Um, but, I'm wondering now, you've got me thinking if some of these fire following species would be good candidates for that type of micro remediation. I haven't heard of it, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing something about that where there was um, a project where folks were putting some kind of um, you know, mycorrhizae into the straw berms, the like bales they were using to isolate burned structures. And so that way runoff would flow through and potentially like absorb toxins or something along those lines. 
but I don't know the details of it. It's I mean, an interesting that, idea. That makes sense. And, and with all of the advances in, in using um, mycelium right now for different, for different uh, industrial needs, I'm, I'm sure someone is working on that. And I'm quite curious about that since my focus is moving more towards fire now. So that's an excellent question. Another great question here. Any source for local foraging groups? Ooh, yes. There is an organization called um, Sonoma Mycological Association, and their acronym is SOMA, and they will do uh, group forays up at Salt Point, and they'll have monthly meetings that I'm sure right now are on Zoom, but SOMA is a great local organization. Um, there's also the um, Mycological Society of San Francisco, MSSF. Maybe we can uh, add a list of these in the follow-up email as well. Um, there's the Bay Area Mycological Society, BAMS. Um, I'm not as familiar with, with what they do. They're mostly in the East Bay. Um, but MSSF is always having um, events and speaker series. And then the Santa Cruz Fungus Federation is, it's a little bit further, but they have a really great website and um, a lot of information as well. But for local people, SOMA is the, is the first place I would, I would start. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, a question about boletes. Um, are there any uh, confusions about boletes? Are they edible? So are there any uh -huh. that you could like mistake? Oh, yes. For, yeah. Yes. So... Uh, when you're getting started, a good rule of thumb with boletes is until you're more comfortable with the different groups and varieties out there, you want to avoid any that have like um, reddish or uh, bluish features. So if they have like a really red uh, bulbous uh, stipe, you want to avoid that. Um, I say that and as I'm, I'm thinking of a bolete with a red cap that turns blue, the the manzanita bully that's actually delicious. But uh, when you're getting started, it's a good idea to just stick to the ones that are, are beige and don't have any color changes. Yeah. Because yeah, there are a lot of bullies. It's a wide um, name for, it's a, it's a, bullies is a, a name for a wide group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a comment added, I believe the myco remediation groups with the fire response are using oyster mushrooms ah. and others that are found to be particularly good at remediating things like oil spills. Right. So um, oyster mushrooms are definitely used in oil spills, but I don't know if, if that, that's what's being used in the fire as well, I wonder, because they're already used to producing those mycelial mats for the oil cleanup. Mm-hmm. And then a question here, is it possible to get sick from breathing spores from about three feet away for two hours? Very specific. If, if and if so, are, what might that look like, especially lung, you know, okay. considering your lungs? Um, if you are immunocompromised, um, that could be an issue. The majority of us, our immune systems will take care of um, any inhalation because we are inhaling spores all the time. Um, Unless you're dealing with, you know, black mold that's, you know, particularly toxic, or there's a um, uh, a mushroom that's found in soils in the desert that can cause uh, respiratory illness. Um, unless you're dealing with those, the majority of spores that you were inhaling uh, would be dealt with by your immune system. Unless you're immunocompromised on some sort of, you know, chemo or something, then you could have respiratory issues. Yeah. And there were questions about um, making spore prints and someone else very um, kindly added their information into the chat about what that process is like. But um, if you want to take a moment to tell us a bit about how do you get those beautiful color spore prints. Sure. Uh, so it can be frustrating because as I mentioned, one of the first uh, diagnostic tools they ask you for in the guidebooks is the spore color. And you can't see the spore color unless you make a spore print. Sometimes the spores will deposit a little bit on the stem or the cap below if they're clustered, like, like I showed you with the, oyster, uh, the honey mushrooms. So you can see that they're white or brown. Um, but the other times you just have to kind of guess. And so it's like if you pick up a mushroom and you turn it over and look at the underside of the cap and it's got like a darkish tint to it, you can guess, you know, to put it in the dark group. 
Um, is it has a very white tint, you can guess to put it in the white group, but you don't know the actual color unless you make a score print. And so the way we do that is to remove the cap and lay it down on a piece of paper. Um, now, if you have white spores on white paper, it's not gonna show up. So some people will do aluminum foil or half white, half black paper. Um, <clears throat> but let's say we're just doing standard paper. So you take the cap and you place it face down on the paper and then you wanna cover it with a bowl or um, some sort of vessel that will not, um, that will block the airflow. So the spores will then drop in that pattern as long as there's not air that's gonna um, disturb them. And then after, you know, you can leave it overnight um, and you will hopefully see a spore print. Now, sometimes they've already dropped all their spores. So there are reasons where you won't get a spore print if it's already done a big depositing of spores. Sometimes you'll see a depositing of spores in your wax bag. So you, you get home and you open it up and oh, they dropped all their spores on the way home. So it's trial and error, but the more you try, the, the more you'll get one of those really beautiful images. And it's not, it's not hard, it's a fun project, especially for kids. Great. And so I should also mention that handling these mushrooms, even if you don't know what you're doing and um, you, know, you pick a death cap, like you're not going to poison yourself by handling um, a toxic mushroom. You have to ingest it for those toxins to start uh, working on your body. I, I know when I was growing up, it was like, wash your hands, fungus, they're dirty. And, and I think that in, in Western culture, there's a lot of fear around mushrooms where in, in you know, Scandinavian countries and Eastern European countries, children grow up hunting for mushrooms with, with their family members and there's less of this kind of fear around it. So, um, you know, if you, if you have mushrooms in, the, in your yard and your kids are handling them, as long as, as they're not eating them, then it's, it's not. It's not a risk. So, yeah. so even Thanks if you made a, mentioning that, yeah, even if you made a spore print of a ammonita, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect you negatively. Just don't eat. <laughs> uh, another question that came in that I think I could answer. Um, do you know the mycologist slash author's name from Sonoma County who uses local mushrooms, even poisonous ones, as dyes? I think this question might be referring to Dorothy Beebe. I don't know if you know someone else, Melina. Um, I don't know Dorothy Beebe. She could be a local Sonoma County person, but I do know Alyssa Allen, and she is um, the owner and founder of Myco Pigments. So she will. Uh, she's based in the in the Pacific Northwest, I think, in Washington somewhere. Um, but she will travel with her setup um, and find mushrooms that are good uh, for fabric dyeing, and then she'll do a workshop on how to dye fabric with those mushrooms and, um, you know, yarn. And, and so mycopigments is a good place to start. I, I don't know Dorothy, but Alyssa Allen is, is a really knowledgeable um, mushroom dyer. Yeah, some of the colors you can get from different mushrooms are beautiful. Yeah, um, a question here about pets eating mushrooms, that if a pet eats a mushroom that's toxic to humans, will it harm them as well? It's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, ha that happens a lot. We'll get emails from panicked pet owners. My dog ate a mushroom. And it's like, if you have more of the mushroom um, and can send it to somebody knowledgeable, uh, that's great, uh, especially using the photo tips, um, inducing vomiting as soon as possible, calling your vet. But if they eat, a, I have heard sad stories about, mushroom, about dogs that, that ate the wrong mushroom and didn't and make it so the majority of them are just going to make them sick and you know the same way they affect us the gastrointestinal stress mm -hmm. and fine, but in certain instances if it's a if it's an ammonita then it could cause more serious problems mm -hmm. yeah and i i'm we haven't gotten more questions in but i actually wanted to bring up morels because you were mentioning them um i I had an experience recently where we made a huge batch of morel risotto and I ate it for like three meals over the course of like 24 hours, along with like a couple glasses of wine. And I had a reaction that I was totally not expecting. Like all my skin felt really itchy and I had like anxiety and felt nause nauseated. And it was such a surprise because I, I didn't realize that morels could do that. 
Um, and I don't know well, if you have more information about that. Um, I'm going to just kind of speak generally to any edible mushroom. Um, everyone is different and some people will eat the same thing as everyone else and have a reaction. Uh, mm -hmm. So anytime you're eating edible mushrooms, you want to start small uh, to see how your body reacts. So say you find, you know, 15 pounds of something like have a reasonable take amount. Easy. <laughs> yeah, take it easy, see how you react and then carry on. Also, um, certain, I'm not speaking to morels specifically because I'm not sure. I have some ideas about what could have happened. Um, certain mushrooms that have um, toxins that could affect you negatively in small doses will accumulate. So what caught my attention was that you said you continued to eat it over time. So you may have a slight reaction to a few mushrooms, but after you've eaten four, you know, servings of it, it, it accumulates in your body. Um, there are some mushrooms that uh, will react with alcohol and make your body not able to metabolize it as well. So there's a specific mushroom, I actually almost put it in here, but I didn't for the sake of time, that um, if you were to drink alcohol, even, you know, the day after you ate the mushroom and still had it in your system, it could make you feel very, very drunk because <laughs> your body's not able to process the metabolism or to properly metabolize the alcohol. Um, so there, there are instances like that. There's also um, some species of false morels out there that look very, very similar to morels. And it's possible one made it into a batch, you know, so it's not enough of a problem to, you know, make you really sick, but to have a reaction to. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, it was it was such a bummer because the risotto was clearly really delicious. I ate it, you know, for like two <laughs> days straight. <laughs> I'm guessing. Uh, the accumulation of stuff. I think that's what it was. I, you know, I was like, it was really hitting me in the night when I tried to fall asleep. And so I was like on my phone, Googling it and what you just said pretty much re reflects what I found. So, um, yeah, uh, question here, which you talked a little bit about, um, how do we pick mushrooms ecologically? So thinking about, you know, conserving the system and. So the biggest issue is us not treading lightly, in my opinion. Um, I see a lot of trash. I see people trampling plants. And really what you want to avoid is disturbing that mycelial mat underneath the soil. So if you're picking in a way where you're being conscious of the ecosystem around you and you're not tossing logs over and disturbing the leaf litter and leaving your trash like that's the most obvious way we can tread lightly um another good rule of thumb is not ever picking a patch to completion because if we leave i like to say to leave at least 20 percent behind because that gives the mushrooms a chance to sporulate make new strains be more uh, able to you know survive in the in the habitat that they're in. Um, when things reproduce sexually, they're adding variation to their genes. They're, they're, there's genetic variation introduced and that is going to allow certain individuals to survive in one condition over another. And so if we're limiting a species ability to introduce that type of variation, um, we're, we're not doing them, uh, uh, we're doing them a disservice. So I like to say, even if it's the most delicious patch of porcini you've ever seen, leave some of the small ones behind to have a chance to mature and spread their spores. Um, and yeah. just, you know, be respectful of, of the environment that you're in and, and tread lightly. Um, also, when you're harvesting a mushroom. I, I did mention that it's important to get all of those bottom features for identification, but there's ways to do that. You can take your mushroom knife um, or your trowel and, and, and dig right down to the base and kind of pry it up and then snip it off um, without pulling up all of the mycelia that's, that's connected at the bottom there. So 
that can be hard to do when you're in a patch and you're like, oh my God, there's a million on this symbol. But um, yeah, it's, it's better to just try not to disturb the ground and don't take everything. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was also a question, um, is there a way to uh, contact you if oh, someone yeah. wanted to follow up? Sure. Um, uh, you guys have my email. It's just uh, my first initial and my last name, M. Cosinitas at Gmail, is um, the my main. I mean, I have Berkeley email and this email and that email, but that's my direct. Excellent. Yeah, and I can include that in the follow up email as well. Right. Um, and yeah, if anyone needs to get in touch uh, with me, also, you're welcome to do that. It's holland.chastelli at uh, pepperwoodpreserve.org. And I'll be the one sending out our follow-up email. So I can include that in there as well. All right, let's see. Well, let's take this one more question and then I, I think we'll all go our separate ways, enjoy the rest of our Saturday. Is there a way to tell what mushroom a spore came from if you have spores without the mushroom? Ah, <laughs> that's tricky. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, there's some ways you could test genetically what that is, but that would that would require some serious lab equipment, and uh, it would that would be difficult to do on your own. However, there are certain spores that are very distinct under the microscope. So if you had a uh, compound microscope, so not the kind that just um, magnifies things, but the kind that light passes through a, a skinny, a very thin cross section, um, you can see certain spores that are very, very distinct. Um, so there's different genera of mushrooms that will always have, you know, pore on the top or be shaped like a football or some are very spiny um, and, and have like, angular uh, uh, I don't know features to them. So yes, there are really distinct spores, spore shapes, um, but you would need a, a microscope and then a book to tell you which which mushrooms have distinct spore shapes. That's a great question. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank Melina for sharing all that wonderful information and being willing to do this strange virtual version of teaching. Um, and invite you all to stay in touch, follow us on social media, um, and as I said, keep an eye on the website for upcoming classes and opportunities to get out on the land. Thanks, Holland. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. All right. Thank you all. Have a great Saturday. Thank you. Thank you.